Support comes from Thomas Nelson Community College, now becoming Virginia Peninsula Community College, the first choice, whether starting your bachelor's degree or advancing your career. More at tncc.edu. Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, carrying out your charitable wishes forever, whether it's helping shelter animals, feeding the homeless, enhancing the arts, or supporting students. Learn more at leaveabequest.org. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Laura Murphy, a Fairfax County, Virginia mother, has been fighting since 2013 to have the book Beloved, written by Toni Morrison, banned from Fairfax County Public School Libraries and High School Curriculum. This year, Virginia Beach School Board members Victoria Manning and Laura Hughes are demanding that another Toni Morrison book, The Bluest Eye, also be banned, along with five other books. Is the practice of book banning the way to achieve the goal of a fair and equitable educational experience for all children? That's our topic today on Another View, right after this news from NPR and WHRV News. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. On this Veterans Day, we here at Another View honor all veterans and their families. We are grateful for your sacrifice and for keeping our country and us safe. And we hope that you are having a wonderful day. So now on to our subject for today's Another View, um, banning books in Virginia public schools, particularly in Fairfax County and Virginia Beach public schools. The books in question, two books from Nobel laureate and Pulitzer Prize winning author Toni Morrison, Beloved and the Bluest Eye, along with A Lesson Before Dying by Ernest Gaines. Beyond Magenta, Transgender Teens Speak Out by Susan Culkin. Lawn Boy by Jonathan Ev- um, Evison, Gender Queer by Meyer Kobabe, and Good Trouble Lessons from the Civil Rights Playbook by Christopher Knoxon, who joins us here on Another View. Hi, Christopher. How are you? I'm great. Great to be with you, Barbara. Thank you so much for joining us. And we are also joined by author, former poet laureate, and professor emeritus at ODU, Tim Siebels. Hello, Tim. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? It's good to talk to you. It's been a while. <laughs> yes, it has been a while. Good to be back, though. Thank you. And doctoral candidate and curriculum and award-winning community program developer, Jamika Anderson. Hello, Jamika. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Thanks so much for joining us today. And Dr. No and Dr. Donna Graham Elliott, she's a retired high school administrator, instructional leader, and English teacher in the Virginia Beach Public School System, who currently serves as an adjunct professor at Tidewater Community College and University Supervisor of English at the College of William and Mary. Uh, Dr. Elliott, how are you? I am fine. Good morning. (laughs) Good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Now, before we get into our our discussion, I must tell you all that Virginia Beach Public Schools are members of the Hampton Roads Educational Telecommunications Association, which owns the license for WHRO Public Media. And also that we reached out to Virginia Beach School Board members, Victoria Manning and Laura Hughes. These are the women who want these books banned. Ms. Manning declined our request and Ms. Hughes did not respond. So, Christopher, I'm going to start with you since your book, Good Trouble, Lessons from the Civil Rights Playbook, is under review and could possibly be banned in Virginia Beach Public Schools. What was your reaction when you heard about this? (laughs) I was astonished. Uh, appalled. I was outraged. um, And I was honored. Honored? (laughs) Frankly, (laughs) honored. Frankly, I mean, to be on a list, uh, you know, with Toni Morrison and Ernest Gaines and and these LGBTQ heroes of mine, I mean, come on, my book (laughs) is a pretty straightforward and very impassioned kind of meditation on the lessons of civil rights. Um, And the idea that 
these school board members would want to silence that history is outrageous and offensive and reprehensible. Um, but the fact that they chose my book out of the 1.5 million titles that are in circulation in Virginia Beach schools and these six books, there are yeah. six books on this list, right? Yes, yes. I mean, and they're talking about pornography. They're talking about divisiveness. And they chose these six books. Now, let's think about what they have in common, <laughs> right? <laughs> are, these, are these books pornographic? Are they are they are they offensive? Are they divisive? Well, well two of them are by by prominent black authors. Three of them deal with LGBTQ issues, and one of them is about civil rights. Mm -hmm. So, what are they really trying to silence here? It seems very clear to me. Yeah. So, according to the complaint, your book quote depicts white people who support former President Donald Trump as Nazis. Is that true? What's in your book? Okay, there's one illustration. I, I still have not heard that directly from any school board member or from a parent. Mm -hmm. That complaint was in a, a pilot article that is hard to attribute where it came from. But there is, a, there is a single illustration in the introduction to the book of some uh, skinheads raising a Nazi salute, which I based on a picture of the Richard Spencer alt-right rally of the National Policy Institute three days after the election of Donald Trump. So is that divisive? Uh, maybe it's also accurate. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, you know, there were, there were alt-right Nazis who were quite pleased that Donald Trump had been uh, elected after, you know, 2016. So I did one drawing. There's no, you know, there's no... Uh, <laughs> equation or text about how Trump supporter, supporters are Nazis. I, I, They're I, clearly I, not all Nazis, but there were some Nazis who were quite overjoyed. And I think that speaks entirely to what we're seeing now. So the purpose, tell us, for those who have not read the book, what was the purpose of, of uh, writing this? Was it to be a blueprint based on what had happened during the city civil rights movement? Well, I'll tell you, I was on, uh, I had not... I didn't know anything about civil rights really beyond what I learned in school as okay. a kid in public school in California. I was on a book tour in Memphis on a novel in 2016, and I happened to go to the uh, Lorraine Hotel. Mm. Uh, this was about three days after the election of Trump, and I was, like a lot of people, sort of uh, shell-shocked and terrified, frankly. And in that moment, I kind of had, you know, a... I'm not exaggerating to say I, I had a revelation. Mm -hmm. um, I started weeping, standing there alone on the sidewalk in that spot mm -hmm. and realized for myself that, you know, the, all the lessons that I needed, all the direction, all the moral clarity, all the resolve, all the dignity that I was seeking was in this story. And mm -hmm. so I set out as a journalist, I had worked, you know, as a journalist my whole life to go mm -hmm. and talk to people who had been involved in the movement and to ask them just the simple question of what can we learn today? What, what oh. lessons from the movement can we apply right now? Mm -hmm. um, so I talked to John Lewis. I talked to, uh, you know, lots of people, foot soldiers, historians, and tried to uh, assemble a kind of current day primer on the, the top level messages of the movement. Okay. All right. So Tim, um, Tony Morrison died in 2019 and there's this desire now in Virginia to, to, um, to ban two of her books. So yeah. does this feel like an erasure of her legacy? What's, what's behind those two particular books? Well, I'm not sure exactly what, what the, uh, fear of those, might be at least well, I should say this it depends on what pe how people imagine education now if educate if if by educating your children you mean making sure that they are not troubled by the realities of history well uh, then you could ban you know probably four-fifths of the book <laughs> again. but I'm not sure I mean beloved has some very gripping moments and some, you know, very troubling scenes in it. But, I mean, I think all the time about all the, for example, that we find on 
video, um, video games, uh, mm-hmm. Grand Theft Auto, uh, this or that, World War Three. I'm thinking, so it can't just be violent imagery that troubles them, you know, because you know, unless their kids are also not allowed to play video games too. I'm just thinking, if if it's like the 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 imagery, because I can't imagine that these women who are trying to ban these books and the other people who feel simpatico with them, I can't imagine any movies or any TV shows that show graphic violence. That would be a real story. So it seems to me what's most disturbing to these people who want to ban Toni Morrison, among other books, mm-hmm. uh, uh, they, they would as history is, is what it sounds like to me. And yeah, you don't want to deal with some of the grim realities of slavery. And of course, you don't want to, to deal with white supremacy as a problem in American society. Yeah, sure. Ban every book you can by probably most every black author or author of color. Mm. And if you don't want to deal with sexuality and the complexities thereof, yeah, ban all the books by gay writers, poetry, essay, just ban them all. But my, my thinking is that we really do want our children to grow up with a kind of rich understanding of the complexities of life in a society. Mm. That's what that's what makes literature for me. Of course, mm-hmm. I'm a writer, and of course, a, a person who's taught. Hey Tim, we're going we're going to we're going to um, see if we can work on your line because you keep going in and out, and it's really important that people hear your point. So I'm going to I'm going to ask Dr. Elliot. um, In the meantime. You served as an English instructor in the Virginia Beach Public Schools. You were an instructional, um, uh, did instructional work. What is your reaction to even the thought of removing books as opposed to giving people the freedom of choice? One of the first things I think about, especially when parents want to ban books, is whether or not they've actually read the entire book. You can find passages in any book that appear to be totally unethical or demoralizing. Mm -hmm. But the Virginia Beach school system, just like every school system, is supposed to have committees of people who, first of all, will recommend the book. The books get approved and they follow the objectives of the state and the division. Mm -hmm. So. When that happens and the books are there, you not only look at these two books that they're focusing on in Virginia Beach, all the books they're focusing on, but you go back to all of those books, as was already mentioned. You can, books such as Bridge to Terabithia, A Child Called It, As I Lay Dying, Are You There, God? There are so many others, The Outsiders, The Chocolate War, The Learning Tree, Sounder. All of these books have components that anyone could challenge at any time. But what I really think is, if this division is supposed to be producing children who are critical thinkers, this is part of the process of becoming critical thinkers, and that is taking what you see in print and using it appropriately so that you can objectively make decisions. Mm -hmm. So are we trying to protect the children? Oh, are we trying to protect the wrongdoings of our history? And and when we look at these books and we talk about also incorporating them into the curriculum, I mean, is there work done with the teachers in terms of, of how to teach the book so that there's some context put around it? Absolutely. Whenever books are approved, there are always the objectives that must align with the division and the state; those objectives must mm-hmm. must align, and that's how books get into the curriculum. So, if the committee approves the book, which means that the school board either has approved it or is totally unaware, then the books are taught in the classroom. However, if there are times when a parent who really has read the book has a problem with it, it mm-hmm. is a possibility. And teachers always give this opportunity for students to opt out. They can read an alternative book. And sometimes teachers will also have disclaimers 
about books. So for these these books to be right in the front right now, it has so much to do with our times, what mm. this country is going through right now. And it, it's appalling to realize that some people don't want children to face the realities of our society, but they're going to find them out anyway. The books are in the libraries, they're in the public libraries, they're in the school libraries. So mm -hmm. what are they really protecting? Mm -hmm. Jamika Anderson, you, uh, in addition to serving as um, media literacy consultant for all kinds of national organizations, you spent time as a library outreach coordinator in Charlotte Mecklenburg Library. So I wonder from a librarian perspective, what the, what went through your mind or what goes through your mind when you hear not only Virginia Beach and, and what's going on in Virginia, but frankly, across the country where there are all of a sudden these these school districts uh, who are examining books, who are taking books off the shelves before they've even had a chance to go through the rigorous examination process. What does that mean to you? Well, Barbara, honestly, um, as a librarian, but more, most importantly, as a black girl, okay. <laughs> I honestly feel that um, this isn't an emergent issue. Um, I think that if we kind of step aside and really look at the historical aspect of literacy and what it is and what it has always been, um, it has been about censorship. It has been about regulation. Um, and so when we talk about trying to um, prevent access to certain literature, that has always been the story for marginalized populations. It's always been mm -hmm. the story of my ancestors with um, being prevented to have access to books and to read and how to learn how to read. And then as we progress, preventing them from having access to um, certain content and curriculum. That's not new. And yeah. so what I think that has happened is that we have... Our, our country and our people have went through an awakening, and there's been a lot of amazing authors, black authors, that have had the luxury and opportunity to write and record our history that has been invisible and that has been prevented in curriculum and to the public and to the people. And so we're now seeing more people wanting to know. We're, we're seeing more people wanting to know about race and how it impacted our, and mm -hmm. our our history. And so with that being said, this is just another, this is a, the same old trick to prevent and to label something as bad, to censor it, and to prevent the system of hegemony that has existed for so long from being dismantled. And so with everything that's also being play, played out with critical race theory in this conversation, it's not a surprise or a shock to see what's happening right now with the censorship or regulation of literature. Well, I will say being a librarian that 80% of librarians in our country are white and mm -hmm. predominantly white women. And that goes in the same with education as well. So when we talk about the gatekeepers of knowledge and what censorship is, I think it's a really thin line between regulation and the history of truth that that's allowed to be told. Yeah, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call to join our conversation. What do you think about banning books from schools, from the public libraries? Um, what is it? Is it a dangerous practice or is it something that we will continue to see? Because this is not the first time that this has happened. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Zero. You know, Christopher, people could think when, when we look at the list of books and so forth, um, a lot of the topics have to do with race and they have to do with um, LGBTQ plus issues. Um, as a white author who is writing about civil rights, you know, do you see any irony or, or <laughs> um, a dichotomy in, in terms of thought in, in this? Well, I mean, again, I'm honored. <laughs> to, to be included with this group, because um, I just feel like, uh, you know, it's it's baffling and also um, it, it's quite I, I, I want to circle back for a second to what was just being said about how this is just history repeating itself. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to to understand, at least from my vantage point, that this is really not about protecting kids from pornography or even really CRT. This is about power. It's about the election that happened last Tuesday in Virginia. 
It's about harnessing and activating a base of voters that they believe are afraid of otherness, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think that they don't, I called uh, the, the, the school board members, Barbara Johns, I mean, uh, Victoria Manning and Laura Hughes, they didn't uh -huh. get back to me. They're, they're, they're not interested in having this discussion about what's in these books. All they're interested in doing is firing up their voters. This is an old playbook. It's mm -hmm. what uh, conservatives have been doing to stop racial justice for generations. I mean, when I was doing research about civil rights, you find, you know, the White Citizen Council talked about moral restoration and they talked about the loose morals of the uh, freedom movement. Um, you know, George Wallace had these great big rallies where they talked about activists and militants and revolutionaries and anarchists and communists. I mean, this is the way that they maintain power. They get their fearful constituents whipped up into a moral frenzy, mm -hmm. into a panic, and that gets them out to the polls. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, we can sit here on NPR and talk about how, uh, you know, the, the importance of this literature, but they're not really having the same discussion. We're talking over yeah. each other. Yeah, exactly, because we're not talking to each other at all about this. And Dr. Elliot, you know, the thought that, that the book, that one person can walk into an administrator's office or the superintendent's office and demand that a book be taken away. And it is taken off the shelf and then reviewed as opposed to leaving it there and doing the review. Why is it so easy for that to happen? It is all about intimidation and having that mm -hmm. voice. The louder that you are, the more people will back off. And, Administrators, just like teachers and anyone else in certain positions, don't want controversy. And the first thing that happens when anything occurs in a school system is the news gets wind of it. And sometimes people twist it in a manner in which it should not be. So mm -hmm. in order to keep the parents quiet, mm. that's just what they do. They just decide. All right, we'll take it off, but the book has already been reviewed by the committee. The objectives again, and before again, it ever, said, before it even ever yeah. re got on the shelf in the first place. Right. Hmm. So, Tim, why are we not getting outrage on the other side? From this, I mean, it seems like it is so easy for those who say take it away to get, you know, heard and and and, you know, and, and so forth. But I don't hear the outrage on the other side. Well, I mean, it depends, I guess, on the circles you're in. I think the media, at least up to this moment, certainly hasn't featured any of the outrage on the other side. But okay. I certainly know people who are outraged about, about the issue and and. Um, in part, I think maybe uh, people think, ah, you know, this this won't really go very far. But I think, as with the election of the previous president, uh, people underestimate how well organized certain kinds of evil are, and how how easily seduced groups of people are with regard to, you know, banning a book or thinking that they can cure some aspect of their own fear by just, if we just don't talk about slavery, if we just don't talk about sexuality, I think people forget how easy it is to seduce a certain segment of the population by, but the idea that if we can just push it into the shadows, it'll just go away. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what makes it so tempting for the for the naysayers with regard to Toni Morrison and other authors. Uh, for the, those of us who believe that books are an important part of being a, a citizen in a society, well, you just, it's, it's kind of shocking, as your other guest was, was talking about, you're kind of shocked that, first of all, people are still talking about banning books. You like to think that that would be relegated to some, some other place or some other time. Mm. But, of course, we, we have elements in this society that are, are terrified of certain ideas becoming part of the of the conversation and the culture. Th those ideas are going to get there regardless. In my heart of hearts, I believe this, but these people will do what they can to delay a certain kind of uh, understanding about certain issues. 
If you're just joining us, we're talking about banning books in Virginia public schools with Christopher Knoxon, author of Good Trouble, Lessons from the Civil Rights Playbook, a proposed book to be banned. Author, former poet laureate and professor emeritus at ODU, Tim Siebels, a doctoral candidate and curriculum and award-winning community program developer, uh, Jamika Anderson, and Dr. Donna Graham Elliott, a retired high school administrator, instructional leader, and English teacher in the Virginia Beach Public school system, who currently serves as an adjunct professor at Tidewater Community College and University Supervisor of English at the College of William and Mary, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call to talk about whether or not books should be banned from our public schools. And these particular six books that we're talking about, The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, A Lesson Before Dying by Ernest Gaines, Beyond Magenta, Transgender Teens Speak Out by Susan Culkin, Lawn Boy by Jonathan Evison, Evison, excuse me, Gender Queer by Meyer Kobabe, and uh, Good Trouble, Lessons from a Civil Rights Playbook by Christopher Knoxon. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Christopher, how has your book done since the proposed banning? Well, I mean, I, I don't know uh, sales numbers or anything like that. My, okay. my publisher doesn't really doesn't really share that sort of real-time info. I know that I've been getting a, a ton of messages. Um, and it's, I, I think it's kind of hilarious how, how congl- congratulatory all the messages I'm getting are. I mean, <laughs> Meaning- you know, you'd think that being banned, people are like, Mazel tov. <laughs> you know, there's nothing better for an author to be banned. And it's just sort of ironic. And I, I do think it's worth pointing out that, like, of course, this is outrageous. It's awful. And also, I am feigning outrage, right? Mm. Like, there, there, is a, there is a kind of impulse within the culture for everybody to I, – I don't think – Victoria Manning and Laura Hughes are really outraged about these books. Mm-hmm. I don't think that it, when they go home at night, they're not talking about these horrible pornographic divisive books. What they're doing is they're trying to maintain power. And I'm sitting here talking about how outrageous this ban is. And of course, my book is benefiting from it. Yeah. So I just want to sort of call attention to the fact that there's a lot of theater here. There's a lot of people saying things that they don't actually mean. Um, so I, you know, frankly, I'm hoping I get banned in more school districts so I can go and talk to kids about civil rights, which is the whole point of my book. <laughs> you know, this everybody's ho- everybody's using this to advance their own agenda. Right, right. Tim, how much does this have to do with this whole narrative of, which, as far as I'm concerned, is a false narrative of critical race theory? Well. I mean, I think with regard to Toni Morrison's book in particular, Mm -hmm. uh, she did not pull any punches with regard to how white supremacy enacted itself both uh, during the time of slavery and since. And so I think a lot of people, I mean, this is not new, uh, as your other guests have said, this is not a new thing. People just don't want to look in the mirror sometimes. And I think white culture, at least in, in, in America certainly, struggles to look in the mirror with regard to who have we been, who are we now? And I think these books, particularly Morrison's books, where race is concerned and, and, my, and the other gentleman's civil rights book, mm-hmm. I mean, they, they pose kind of inescapable questions about what has, it mean, what has whiteness meant and what has whiteness done to those of us who cannot claim whiteness, right? And I think people are very uncomfortable when they look in the mirror and see something in some respects terrible. And I think that's the, that's the real story that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. People just don't want to, they don't, it's like, it's like a family secret, right? We all know that, that, you know, their uncle Bob was a a little strange. So we just don't bring uncle Bob up. As long as we don't talk about it. (laughs) Right. But, but in this, in this case, it's an entire society, not entirely, but many, many folks. Mm-hmm. Who would just rather not talk about the Uncle Bob su- white supremacist in the closet? <laughs> they don't want to talk about Uncle Bob, which is a problem. So, Jamaica, <laughs> why not? Why not just have, you know, 
I guess the question is, what makes it okay for one person or one group of people to try to decide the education of the mass group? In other words, it's it's fine if you don't want your child to read a certain book within your your household, but why do you get to decide what my household does? Jamika? Uh-oh. Did we I'm lose I'm so you? sorry. Oh. No, nope, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> I was on mute. My, my apologies. <laughs> I, but I'm sorry. You, you missed my laugh because that's a great question. <laughs> um, wh- is it okay? No. Why does some people feel it is okay? Because that's the way it always has been. Um, mm-hmm. Everything about education in the United States, United States has been centered on Eurocentric ideology. What we read, what we learn, if you are not white, who you are, every and everything that we're taught has been based on the conformity of what they have set as the standard. There's a quote that says, if you control the word, you can control the world. And so when you have always had the power to control the narrative, a narrative that has always been, that has never been banned, mm-hmm. has always been accepted to say that, you know, um, Native Americans are bad and violent and African Americans or black people are barbaric and animalistic and criminals or LGBTQ people are predators. Those right. those narratives have historically been okay and never questioned and never banned. And those that have been subjugated by them, that have been oppressed by them, we have been able to do nothing but accept it and try our hardest to fight to create new narratives. But they have had the power to create that narrative. So anything now that is produced that shows how those oppressive narratives that should have been made have impacted us, has inflicted trauma on our parents, our ancestors, and then has also inflicted trauma on the children from their adults, their parents that have experienced that trauma. And now us as adults, Mm -hmm. we tell our stories, it's bad. So then it questions, what is bad? Is it you saying something is bad or is it really beyond the language, but the actions? that have happened historically that you're preventing, that you're trying to make invisible. So they have always controlled the narrative. White supremacy has controlled the word, has controlled the narrative, and that's why they feel that they should still be able to control and regulate that narrative. And it sounds like, though, that there may be some younger parents out there who may see this a little bit differently. What do you think? Oh, I... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I definitely, I definitely, I consider myself a young parent. I have uh-huh. a 12 year old, but I, <laughs> um, I think that a lot has changed over time. Like I said, I feel that, um, a lot has been able to kind of get exposed. If mm-hmm. I can, if I can kind of set the tone of what that looks like, my mother who went to school in the sixties, I was having a conversation with her not too long ago and we were just talking about, um, Christopher, Christopher Columbus Day. And I was telling her, you know, Christopher Columbus didn't discover America. And my mom said, huh, what? Mm. And this is my mother, an African-American woman. And this is what she was taught. taught. And so for me growing up in a different, a different world where truth has been questioned, where critical thinking has been a lot more accepted, embraced by marginalized populations, I definitely approach my child and what she has access to and what she should learn differently. I want her to be exposed to truth. I mm. want her to know truth mm. about who she is in her history. All right. Our phone lines are lit up, so let's take some calls. Sandra joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Sandra. You're in the air. Hi. I am very concerned about the idea of good trouble being taken off the shelves in Virginia Beach. It's very important for our children to learn how to agitate for their civil rights. And I wanted to find out when that next school board meeting is so that I and others can attend that so that there won't be just one side speaking out for what should our children should be reading. Okay, we will. I'm going to ask my producer, Lisa, to look up when the next school board meeting is. So maybe we can let you know before the end of uh, end of the show. Um, Christopher, you would like to respond to Sandra? She's talking about your book. Uh, yeah, there was a school board hearing, um, uh, I guess, about 10 days ago. And just so you know, there were about, I, I want to say, 20 or 25 students, high school students, who came before the board to defend uh, the books that were are, are being targeted. So there is, a, you know, opposition among the student body. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then there was 20 uh, parents, um, all white, who... I think there was one uh, black woman, but they basically defended the ban 
And their reasoning was was fascinating. Um, multiple parents talked about the fact that these books are being used by government schools to groom kids for molesters and sexual predators. <sighs> We're into the realm of like QAnon and conspiracy theories that are just sort of off the reservation. Um, so, you know, we're not talking about a kind of rational uh, debate about literature here. We're talking about some sort of fringe. Um, you know, when I was researching this issue, it all the books on this list, on the Virginia Beach list, mm -hmm. started in Texas. And what happened was there was a, a mom who came before a school board meeting there and read passages from the book Lawn Boy. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody got it on video and it went viral on TikTok of this Texas mom reading about, you know, a, a sexually explicit scene between two nine year old boys. Uh, and of course, you know, he the author of that book then got targeted by um, QAnon folks and told that he was part of this sort of pedophilic ring. Um, mm. And, you know, clearly this is a political tactic that's working for conservatives and they brought it to Virginia so that they could win the governor's race. They're going to do it next year in the midterms. This is, this is a political play. It's not about, it's not about the kids. kids. You're, you're, you're positing. No. It's not about the kids. Yeah. It's not about the kids. It's about politics and power. Okay. Let's go to Philip in Norfolk. Hi, Philip. You're on the air. Hi, Barbara. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I love your show. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I met you at uh, Virginia Wesleyan a year or two ago with those uh, seminars. Oh, okay. <laughs> What's your question? <laughs> um, well, no, I just had a comment. Um, okay. I really think it's amusing when people ban books because, first of all, it's the first book I go out to buy. I have a special shelf for them. And um, it just always makes me wonder that they do not realize that it backfires on them because... It, uh, it exposes their bigotry or racism or whatever problem they have. And any child that asks, uh, sees that, their first question is going to be, why is it banned? And they're going to go out and, and ask questions about it and read the book. So I, I think it's ironic that they do that. <laughs> Thank you so much for the call, Philip, and thanks for, for checking us out at Virginia Wesleyan when we're over there. Uh, Tim, you want to respond in terms of, of I, I'm curious, one... Well, Philip's exactly uh, right. Yes, go ahead. You hear me? Yes, now I can. Okay, yes. yeah. Philip's, Philip's exactly right. I mean, if you ban a book, the sales at some point are going to go up. You know, they're not going to go down. You know, now it'd be different if people were burning books then the book wouldn't exist, but the books exist. And people say, oh, you should never read that. But well, as he suggested, and as some of the other guests uh, suggested, mm -hmm. people are going to be very curious about why it's being banned and, and they'll, they'll want to read it. Mm -hmm. So I think, so I think that it, it does in fact backfire, but I believe, um, uh, I think it was another guest that said, you know, it's not really about the books. It's about a pose, right? Yeah. It's about, Acting like acting, you know, terrified of a certain literature because what you're really trying to do is drum up, you know, increase the fear in the population so that they will behave a certain way, perhaps in the midterm elections mm -hmm. or in local elections. It just depends. But fear has been fear has been a fuel for many kinds of insanity, not only in America but all over the world. So anyone who can say. Oh, don't let this happen to your children. Or this book is dangerous in this way. People are seem, for whatever reason, seem to be all too ready to say, "Yeah, I'm really disturbed." Many of them, of course, know nothing about the books that are being I, talked about and being banned. And I think you that's know? the thing that that surprises me more than anything else is the fact that they they will stand there and so openly admit that they've never read the book. And I don't right. know how you criticize something if you've never experienced it yourself. Of four 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 zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero. For our caller Sandra, who called in uh, earlier, the Virginia Beach School Board meets the second and fourth Tuesday of each month, and so the next meeting is November the twenty third. So I hope that that helps you out. And let's go to Robert in Virginia Beach. Hi, Robert. You're on the air. Hey, everybody. Hope y'all are having a great day. It's beautiful outside. 
Thank this, you. Uh, Virginia Beach has a huge problem. I think Pharrell's already brought that to light. And what we're dealing with here is white Christian ice, plain as day. And, you know, I think we should ban the Bible. If they want to ban books, let's ban the Bible. It's got plenty of pornography, adultery, all kinds of stuff in the Old Testament that they should be upset about. And I don't understand why they don't add that to their list. Okay, Robert, thanks so much for that call. <laughs> you know what? I want to ask you, Jamika, from a young person's perspective, um, if they take these books out of the school library, does that mean that these children will never be exposed to the book? <laughs> Absolutely not. I, I'm going to be quite honest. As a child growing up, I was a reluctant reader myself. And the first book that grabbed my attention was um, Fly Girl by Omar Tyree and The Coldest Winter Ever by Sister Soldier. Mm -hmm. And that's what got me reading because in those books, I saw experiences of myself, my family members um, that we went through and that I was going through. Um, those books are not in schools. And so I do want to highlight this because I can't remember. I think it was Chris and he was using terms like outrage and, you know, <laughs> how these people are seeming like they're outrage. But, you know, just me, you know, in my background in curriculum and instruction, specifically urban education, I got to throw these numbers out there to you. Mm -hmm. In America, only 19 percent of black girls are proficient in reading and only 11 mm percent -hmm. of boys are proficient in reading. So when we talk about outrage, I think that that means something. And a lot of that, if, if, if people actually go and do the research and learn, it's because they cannot connect with a lot of the literature that is presented to them in our schools. Mm. I can attest to that. And there are a lot of these um, um, children are avid readers outside of schools if they find their connection and passion to reading. And for and with that being said, they're going to search. They're going to search for other mm -hmm. literature. Mm -hmm. They're going to find and they're going to find it and they're going to find those stories that connect to them because there are there are truths. That these stories tell the experiences that we've been through, especially if you are someone that has had in intersectional experiences of poverty and being black and being woman and being bisexual or LGBTQ, you're going to relate to these stories and you want to find these stories because in there, they're stilling and refuge. And so with them blocking that access to youth that are going through these experiences, they're going to seek them. And for me, it was a friend giving me the book. Wow. So, no, they will be able to access those stories. Absolutely. And Dr. Elliot, isn't, uh, to Jamika's point, the, having the variety of stories and of, of books to read, isn't that the whole goal of education so that so that there will be something that will connect with the child so that they can that go is, ahead and open their minds? Yes, that is the entire goal. And that is the reason that they have such a variety within the curriculum. And to give you an example, once when I worked with a student teacher at William & Mary and she was going to teach To Kill a Mockingbird, mm -hmm. we went over some key components within that novel and she had the communication with the parents to let them know some of the subject matter because many of the parents had not read the book. So it worked out very well because she had a pulse on the children. She had a pulse on the demographics and the subject matter. And mm -hmm. she took that information and she massaged it to the point where the kids were very curious and they asked her specific questions and we work with them on the entire thing. So when you decide that you're going to take certain books away, then what is left? Mm. What is left and then what is the ultimate goal? Okay. And I'm going to come back to you in just a minute because I'm going to talk about solutions. But these phone lines are so lit up. I'm going to take a couple more calls. Uh, Cassandra joins us from Williamsburg. Hi, Cassandra. You're on the air. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. I just wanted to say, as a white woman growing up, I wasn't exposed to any of these authors until I went to college. I took an African-American literature class. I learned about Lorraine Hansberry, Toni Morrison then. And it's shaped my adult life. And the fact that these kids are, these books are being asked to be taken away when they, kids could be exposed to them much earlier, it just makes me very sad. And thanks for having this conversation. Thank you so much for that call. I appreciate that. Christopher, would you like to respond? Of course. 
Uh, it's funny. I got a message from somebody this week saying that um, I had avoided talking about the actual content of some of these books and that some of these books have have objectionable, quote unquote, material. I mean, clearly, like my book is is included in a elementary school in Virginia Beach. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, it is 100 percent appropriate for kids of that age. I think what triggered the ban, at least uh, my book being included in it, was that 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 good trouble is really challenging the idea that civil rights is a story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm -hmm. That uh, that the story began with with Rosa Parks and ended with the Civil Rights Act. Mm -hmm. I, I I learned through writing it and through talking to people that civil rights is as old as this country and older, <laughs> mm -hmm. and and broader than this country and as current as today's news. That the the whole idea of of civil rights is that we need to constantly be vigilant about protecting yeah. uh, human dignity. That's... And there are assaults on that human dignity all the time, and this ban is one of those assaults. Yes. Let's talk to Anita in Chesapeake. Hi, Anita. You're in the air. Thanks for taking my call. This is such a great subject, and yet it's a very sad subject. I hate to think that they will take these books out of school. However, Virginia Beach is a very prejudiced area. This is why we don't have light rail going there. This is their last breath. They're sucking for air. And this is how they're going to, you know, control the narrative. Let's not teach our children the truth. Let's keep them hidden. Have patience, my children. It's soon going to pass. Anita, Give thank you. 15 years, 15 years and white majority will not rule in Virginia Beach anymore. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much for that call. Dr. Elliot, let me ask you a question. How um, are teachers working around this, if, if they are at all? I mean, in other words, if, if a book is banned or, or whatever, does that mean then that they can't even, they can't talk about it, they can't teach it? How does that, how does that work? I think that it depends on the administration okay. whose decisions come from the superintendent's office the curriculum specialist and the assistant superintendent for high school education in this case. Mm -hmm. So what are the directives are there? That's what the teachers do until they get further notification. So the, the sad part is at the next school board meeting or even at the last school board meeting, if the voices of those who think that banning books is not the right thing to do. It's not the ethical thing to do where the children are concerned, where the futures are concerned. Their voices can be just as loud. But the teachers are talking about it because this is part of their content. So even if everything is on hold right now, mm -hmm. they're still talking about it because that's what they do. That's what teachers have to do. They have to collaborate and they have to make alternative decisions. Okay, we've got about five minutes left in the show. I want to ask each of my guests to answer this question. What do we do about it? How do we either change it or, or make our make other voices heard so that um, we can have books and people can make choices? And I'm going to start with you, Christopher. I mean, I'm going to quote uh, John Lewis, in, in, who is sort of my, my spiritual hero as well as tactical hero which is you've got to show up and make good trouble. Put your body in it. Mm -hmm. um, go to the hearing. Raise your voice. Um, and get involved in direct action. Put pressure on these leaders so they know that this is unacceptable and it will not stand. Okay, that is Christopher Knoxon. He is author of Good Trouble, Lessons from the Civil Rights Playbook, which is one of the books, proposed books, to be banned in Virginia Beach Public Schools. Christopher, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. We really appreciate it. And My pleasure. Thanks. Take care. Uh, Tim, I'm coming to you next. Tim Siebels? <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 I completely agree with Christopher about direct action, of course. And mm -hmm. uh, a new book just came out um sponsored by the New York Times, the 1619 Project. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of this book? Yes. Anyway, I've just ordered a couple of copies to give to friends of mine who teach uh, high, in high schools because, they, you know, I think it's a really important book, and whether or not they can use it for the class or not, I do not know. But, but it will certainly give them a, a, a 
a broader foundation from which to discuss things like civil rights and race in this country. Other than that, of course, you know, vote. You know, that's one way to, to combat this kind of <laughs> idiocy, but also persist. I mean, you know, we'll, we're all going to be in conversations with, with peers and stuff. Bring it up. Talk about it. What do you think about this ban? Most of the friends I've talked to think it's absurd. And, 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 and of course, I agree with them. So I don't think this kind of uh, approach to, to education or banning education is going to hold. So okay. I feel, as I said, I feel confident. Thank you, Tim Siebels. He is author, former poet laureate, and um, professor emeritus at Old Dominion University and a good friend of Another View. Thanks, Tim, so much for being with us today. We appreciate it. Okay, Jamika, what do we do? (laughs) I agree with everything my my fellow panel mates just shared. Um, (laughs) Take action. But, you know, I'm I'm a community organizer, so I'm going to say even if they ban the books, they can't stop us from reading. reading. So if you're an adult out there, form form book clubs for kids. You know, bring these books up, bring conversations to the table, help them unpack the issues and challenges that are happening in our world, our realities, talk about it, um, encourage others to read some of, the, some of the literature and educate themselves. They can ban the books, but they can't stop us from reading. Thank you so very, very much. That is Jamika Anderson. She's a doctoral candidate and curriculum and award-winning community program developer out of North Carolina. Thank you very much for joining us today, Jamika and Dr. Donna Elliott, you have the final word. What do we do? We use our voices. I am always telling my students, use your voice because it is important. For every example that is opposed, find three examples in the book that show why we should support it. Hmm. Absolutely. And and how about this also? Should they actually, people, before they start to criticize, actually read the book? Definitely. <laughs> that is number one. I tell you, that is that is the thing that just amazes me more than anything else. That's Dr. Donna Graham Elliott. She's a retired high school administrator, instructional leader, and English teacher in the Virginia Beach public school system, um, who currently serves as adjunct professor at Tidewater Community College and the university supervisor of English at the College of William and Mary. I really appreciate all of you being with us today. And Todd, do we have some music? Can we go to a quick break? And we'll be right back. Wow, what a powerful conversation we had today. Please do me a favor and share it with a friend. You can visit our website, anotherviewradio.org, and download the podcast. And while you're there, do me a favor, because we're really slowly but surely rebuilding our email uh, uh, viewer list. Uh, So sign up for our EV newsletter. It's a a once-a-week reminder of upcoming shows. Uh, We're on Facebook, so you can like us. And I'm on Twitter, at Barbara Ham Lee. So as soon as we sign off the air today, I'm going to get my COVID booster shot. Have you gotten yours? Are you vaccinated at all? The holidays are upon us and folks want to get together. So do your part, everybody. Let's get vaccinated and let's keep yourself and your relatives and families very safe. Our theme music is an original composition created especially for Another View by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Todd Washburn is our audio engineer. And Dr. Barry Graham answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Thank you so very much for listening. And we'll get together again next Thursday at noon for Another View.
Support comes from Thomas Nelson Community College, now becoming Virginia Peninsula Community College, the first choice to start a career. Gain skills in fields like cybersecurity and education. More at tncc.edu. Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, partnering with donors from all walks of life to improve southeastern Virginia through grants, scholarships, and leadership initiatives. Learn more at hamptonroadscf.org.